What's good? This is Master Ace from Brooklyn, New York. Here with my peoples at Breaking Records Radio. Real hip hop will live forever. Hey yo, hey yo, it's your boy Monster Man Rocco. It's your boy Swagger Rock. This is Snack the Ripper. Thank you, you have to go to don't know. This is Master Ace. You are not rocking with the best. Breaking Records Radio. Breaking Records, man. Breaking Records Radio. Breaking Records Radio. Breaking Records. Breaking Records. Breaking Records Radio. Let's go. Breaking Records Radio. Press five nine. Breaking records, man. Radio is like the place to be. I don't know. Fuck strange music, man. <laughs> Check it out. Breaking records radio and the place to be. You know what it is. Your host, Maloney. And we got a special, special guest with us right now. Yeah, man. The legendary Master Ace. Thank you, man. What's up, y'all? How's it going, man? Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you in person. Uh, you were one of the first interviews we actually ever did when I first launched the radio show okay. back, I think, what, 2015, I think? An over-the-phone one. But, okay. um, yeah, man. It's amazing to just be here with you in person. It's good to be here, man. Uh, I look forward to getting back up to Canada real soon. Yeah, know? I hope so. Me and Marco need to definitely do a coast-to-coast -coast run through Canada this year. Yeah, definitely, man. You got a lot of love and support up in Canada. Definitely. Yeah, man. Uh, we I seen you at Alma Combo when you and uh, Marco were there last time. And you came out and opened the show with Nostalgia with the backpack on and... I was chilling with Marco's mom right in the front, right there. Okay, yeah. But yeah, great show, man. You put on an amazing performance. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to have you guys come back, man. That'd be amazing. Uh, I actually just interviewed Marco over the phone too when he was in Toronto. Oh yeah. Because he was, uh, you know, he was looking after his pops while he was there, so he didn't yeah. have time to link in person. But yeah, yeah, we we got a really good interview in That's as cool. well too. Great. But um, so yeah, man, I want to take it back a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, you know, cause uh, you. Well, you just got such a thick history in hip hop, so I mean, uh, you know, there's so much stuff you could cover. I doubt we'll touch even 50% of everything, but you know, yeah. um, you know. But me and Marley Mall back in what was it, 80, 87, 88, 86, 86, yeah. and because you won a contest. Well, 87, I guess 87 because yeah, I won the contest, and then um, but I didn't. I won it in like December or yeah. whatever, and then that was December of 86, and then when the new year hit, came around in 87. It took me from the time I won the contest until that summer to actually meet him. So I was calling, calling, calling for six months or whatever, and then finally got a chance to talk to him on the phone, meet him, and then go out to his studio for the first time. And then in that first session, too, you you saw G-Rap record. It's a demo that day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool G-Rap was... He was an unknown commodity, but, but DJ Polo was known because um, he had put out a record already oh okay he had a record with another mc name uh mc frost i think his name was and so um i guess frost was in jail and so polo was ready to put out his next record but this cat was in jail and he found another cat named g rap that he brought to molly studios like this is my new mc yeah and his name is cool g he, st he said his name is cool g and uh and they yeah they recorded um it's a demo or started recording it anyway it was different. I, I never had heard anything like it. It was, I didn't get it at first because you know sampling wasn't really happening yet. Yeah, everything was jump programming, and so um, I didn't really get it. But like a year later, I, I heard it on the radio, and I was like, "Oh, that's the record they were doing." That's so, crazy, yeah, eh? Yeah. So like sitting there, you probably never even imagined, especially G Rap's not even a known commodity at the time. You're right. like, it's just another record. Like you probably didn't even think yeah. anything of it. Like to well, imagine. That that record would go on to launch, you know, exactly. and him to become the legendary MC he is. Never would have known, and I bet he doesn't remember me being there that first day. But yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. That's insane, man. Was Shan was Shan there too? Shan was there that first day. Yeah. Craig G was there that first day. Shan actually was my Marley put me in the in the in the in the what he called the pre production room, which was just a smaller bedroom. Yeah, he put me in there with Shan and had Shan like doing drum programming or something. Um, you know that I found out years later that Sham was like, "Oh, I, I didn't know what I was doing." If he put, if he put you back there with me, that meant that he did, was just like trying to get your, your 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 studio hours for your contest out the way. Yeah. So that was his way of kind of like burning up hours, and he had me in the back room, bedroom. I didn't know I didn't know anything about equipment. I guess Sham didn't know either. But we were back there fooling around, and eventually. He heard me rap, and then I guess from hearing me rap, he decided, you know, this kid's actually okay. I'm gonna keep him, keep him coming back. Yeah. So after my six hours was up, I kept coming back. Oh, word, eh? Yeah. So like, did he hear you that day in the booth, or like he like heard the know, records but, after and was like, oh shit, like, like that's we, nice. We eventually laid a couple of demos down. Yeah. Um, and I guess from hearing those, you know, he liked what he heard, and and 
he decided to have me keep you know coming back and and and, and laying down joints because I laid down a few demos before we got to the Marlon Marlon Control album a year later. Okay, so none of those demos ended up being your records on In Control then. No. Okay, okay. And so Shan, when he was doing the program and producing the records yeah, for you, he, he told me. Like recently, he's like, if he put you in there with me, then he didn't, he didn't care nothing about what you was doing. He just wanted to get you out the way. <laughs> like, you know what? I, I just interviewed Shan actually, uh, what, Thursday on the phone. Okay. Had a great hour-long conversation with him. We've been meaning getting him for time. But one thing I love about Shan is just his brutal honesty. Oh, it's brutal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like absolute brutal honesty. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. he had no fear holding his tongue. Like he just he just says what he's feeling, how yeah. he's feeling it. And yeah. But it's crazy to think too, like he's be he's there just fucking around with equipment, not knowing what he's doing, and then he goes on to produce some former for Snow. How many years later? Which right. is, he just just got picked up by the Doritos commercial, just got picked yeah. up by what Daddy Yankee as well. Like yeah, it's I heard like about that. yeah, it's that's insane. Like you know, it, it worked out well for him in the end. You know what I mean? Yeah, to be back there just hitting them knobs and switches. That's that's crazy. And then so uh, obviously you went out into. Uh, Joined the Juice Crew and stuff, the infamous verse on uh, Symphony, which we kept, we talked about when I interviewed you last, and I'm sure you've talked about a million times mm -hmm. that that record being made. So we won't even touch that. But um, with uh, the Take a Look Around album, Mr. C did a lot of production on there as well as Marley, right? Yeah, he got he did three. He got credit for four, but he did he did three. Oh, okay, yeah. word. And um, well, question. I, you don't have to answer if you don't want, but was it, was there any production you handled in that phase where you didn't get credit for it? Well, I, if you look at the album and take a look around, it says co-produced by me. Yeah, okay, okay. So I got co-production for the entire album. Because yeah. Because I really did have a hand in almost every track. And bringing the samples there and stuff. Bringing, and... I just didn't know how to work the equipment, but I was walking in with records from my mom's collection saying, I want to sam I want to rap over this piece. Yeah. You know, and... You know, Marley would obviously put his magic on it and drum program it and make it sound dope, and then I would rap over it. Oh, so. Okay, so did you bring the Grand Funk Railroad for Music Man to? Um, no, that was actually his record. Oh, word. Okay, that was his record. Word. Um, we were towards the tail end of the album, and we had we had done a late late session, like probably up till four or five in the morning. So I woke up early though, and he was still asleep, and um, I was just fooling around with his records, just going through his records, going through his records, and I found that, and I put the needle down. And I was like, doo, 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 doo. I was like, well, let's go. I brought it back again. And somehow or another, all the way up in the bedroom, he heard it, jumped out, came running downstairs. What's that? <laughs> move out the way. <laughs> and he like, move out the way. <laughs> Boom. And he like immediately started making the beat right there, right there in the spot. Oh, word, eh? Yeah, crazy. And and that was like, that was, we thought we were done with the album and then that record was like one of the last joints. Wow, hey, eh? That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. And a lot of times when I talk to artists, I find that that happens. Like, they'll have an album complete, and then one of the records that ends up being, like, one of those classic records on the albums ends up being one of those last-minute things, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that just kind of happen. Yeah. Like, even Kate Cut from Main Source said that about, like, Live at the Barbecue. Like, See? that was just one of those last joints that just kind of, they're like, ah, the album was done, but, you know, and yeah. it's, it's crazy how that happens, but... You know, and uh, just to even think, like, a lot of hip-hop history we look at now, right? Because in the game, it's so oversaturated nowadays. But back then, there was only so many avenues you could take in, like, you know, like G-Rap, for example. Like, if if Frosh never got locked up, right? people wouldn't even know who G-Rap is, you know? Maybe not. Eric B, or yeah, maybe not. I shouldn't say yeah. shouldn't, but uh, wouldn't. But, like, even uh, Eric B, Rakim, because Rakim was a uh, standing guy. I think, I think it was Bumpy Knuckles who was supposed, supposed to first. to be in that spot, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. it's just, it's insane how, like, you know, these little things that happen in hip-hop history change the complete course of it. Absolutely. And even you, like, you know, being persistent, calling Marley for those six months, you know, if you, if you weren't persistent, you know, and uh, just to even think, like, a lot of hip-hop history we look at now, right because in the game it's so oversaturated nowadays but back then there was only so many avenues you could take and like you know like g-rap for example like if if frosh never got locked up right people wouldn't even know who g-rap is you know maybe not eric b or yeah maybe not i shouldn't say yeah. shouldn't but uh wouldn't but like even uh eric b rakim because rakim was a uh, standing guy i think i think it was bumpy knuckles who was supposed, was supposed to, first. to be in that spot yeah yeah like yeah. it's just it's insane how like you know these little things that happen in hip-hop history change the complete course of it absolutely and even you like you know being persistent calling marley for those six months you know if you if you weren't persistent the one thing that i think about is that um when i was in um middle school my mom was 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 really uh trying to move to atlanta she was trying to get this job in atlanta oh and word she was really really close to us the plan was that i was going to start high school in atlanta oh shit so so when i was in eighth grade she was like you know after you finish eighth grade 
get ready to move. We're, yeah. we're going to be living in Atlanta. And so it just so happened that whatever that job was that she thought she was going to get, it didn't work out. And then she wound up having to come back to Brooklyn. And I think all the time, like, what if that job didn't work out? Yeah. I would have, like, a lot of stuff wouldn't have happened. That contest wouldn't have happened. Yeah. I mean, I might not have ever stepped into a studio and recorded a joint. Yeah. So there you go. And that's another one of those examples. So It's crazy, eh? Things are happening the way, I guess, the way they're supposed to happen. Yeah, they're all meant to be, right? And, do you, like, and that's actually one thing I'm curious of, too. Like, before that competition and stuff, like, you're obviously you're writing stuff because you said that Symphony was one of those, like, verses yeah, you just memorized. had to, like, spit on the spot for yeah, people, right? Yeah. But did you have that, like, were you, did you see this as where your life was going at that point before the contest no. and stuff? Or was it just kind of a hobby? No, nah, it was just, we just did it around the way. It was just, like, you yeah, know, bragging rights at, at your school or yeah. in your neighborhood be the fly dude get some yeah, girls yeah. on you it wasn't really like it wasn't the thought of making a record or, or even making a career out of it was definitely nowhere near my mind i was just like yo i rap i have fun doing it i'm i'm good at it whatever whatever but i didn't see that as a career that's why i went to college i was i was knocking out the books trying to trying to get a degree what, what, what did you go to college for actually for marketing oh really yeah yeah i started off as a chemistry major my first year oh my dad did chemistry actually and um and then i took that first calculus class and i was like I don't think I, because I, I didn't take calculus in high school. That's what it was. I was just too far behind. Yeah. Everybody else um, in, in my classes had taken pre-cal when they were in high school, and I didn't take it. So the math part of it just threw me off, and I wasn't able to, I couldn't hang. Yeah. So I, I fell back, and I went to marketing. Oh, so that's insane, man. So, you, yeah, like the course of hip-hop history, like if your mom would have got that job, yeah, I would, literally would have been completely different. I might not different. have even been, the, I wouldn't, might not have had, ever had a, a rap career. That's insane, man. Yep. That's insane. And then, um, I mean, to move forward from that, too, because I know you've talked about, you know, your, your affiliation with Juice Cream stuff a million times. So we'll, we'll move forward from there. But one thing I was curious is in an interview, I think it was when you're talking about um, the sitting on Chrome 20 year anniversary. But you said, like, when you signed with Delicious, because it's, yeah, it would have been Delicious at that point, right? But uh, you were arguing with them and you wanted to change your name because uh, you were tagging Ace One at the time and stuff. And you, you the way you worded it was, I want, I didn't want, I can't remember specifically how you were, but basically you didn't want the relation I don't to want the any old affiliation with, yeah, I don't want the any affiliation with, you. with Cold Chillin'. Cold Chillin' you. Cold Chillin' you. Cold Chillin' you. With that label, because, you know, that label had really done, done wrong by myself and a lot of other artists. And I felt like, that first album, Take a Look Around, was phase one of my career, and now this is phase two, and I don't want anybody to even remember phase one. Yeah. I wanted to just go with a clean slate. I wanted to start with a clean slate. That's what it was. And what like what was it over at Culture, and just like the same things other people complain about, not getting paid properly, the royalties, yeah, all that like stuff? All that stuff, man. It was just with, like they didn't run... If they had run their label the right way and taken care of their artists in the right way, you know, they could have really flourished as a label. They could have been like a Def Jam. They would have been. I mean, they yeah. were, at, at that time, you know, late 80s, Cold Chillin' and Def Jam were 1 and 1A. Like, they were literally neck and neck. Yeah. Competing for radio slots and, and, and airplay. And both labels had big name artists. You know, Def Jam had LL Cool J, Run DMC. I mean, not even Run DMC. I'm sorry. LL Cool J and uh, I forget what the other Beastie Boys. Beastie Boys, whatever. yeah. And Public Cold, Enemy by 86, PD, yeah. Right. And, and Cold Chillin' had Big Daddy Kane, Biz Marquee, MC Sham. Yeah. So they were really neck and neck with Def Jam, but the difference is that Def Jam took care of their artists. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you'll get some Def Jam artists that'll say they didn't want, you know. But whatever they were getting jerked, whatever way they might have been getting jerked, we were getting jerked way worse. Way worse. Like they, weren't, they, weren't, they were not even accounting to us. Like, and, and to this day, I haven't been accounted to for my first album. Really, eh? And, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been almost three decades. And, I, and I've heard a lot of, I've heard the same sentiment from a lot of people. Like, Shan said the same thing when I was talking to him. And, you know, even just in all the interviews I've watched with other people. And, um, you know, it's a shame, man, because there's a lot of classic material. And really, it's like, for all these artists to be at this point, and they still haven't, like... You're right. Like, it's... That's, um... It's disappointing, really. Those are bad choices by... You know, Tyrone Williams and Lenny Fischelberg, they were the two heads of the label, the president and the CEO. And, you know, they didn't, uh, they, did, they they looked at all the money that was coming in. They looked at that as their money. Yeah. And so they were, they were out living the, living the big life, champagnes, parties, limousines, yachts, 
you know, like literally, like, like that, like, eh? literally, like that. Wow. Like, like literally spending all this money up that was supposed to be for artists and for their budgets. And you guys are still taking the train and shit to come to the studio. I know Shantae was taking the train up until like her first album came out. And her, <sighs> she was like, "How am I taking the train with a with a one year old and everybody else is and and Marley and Fly Tide? These guys all got brand new cars. And I'm, yeah, and I'm taking the train. It doesn't make sense." So, like, what would they do that back then? Like, do, did they just break you off, like, what, like, kind of, like, similar, like, uh, what people say Sugar's doing at death row, like, just break you off, like, allowances and stuff when you yeah. kind of ask for money? And everybody, it, well, the only people that were on uh, that stipend thing was, yeah. was Shan and Shantae. Okay. They were on a stipend. They came up every week, every single week, and Shan got a check for $1,500 or whatever it was. Um, and with me, once I kind of saw... Oh, oh, you can do that? Yeah. Then I had like maybe one or two occasions where I was low on cash and I would call and he's like, yeah, come up. And they would come up and just write me a check for 1500 just to send me on my way. Yeah, keep you quiet for a bit. Yeah, yeah, send me on my way. But there was no accounting. So I didn't know what I was... I probably was owed five times that. Yeah. And so... That's just how it was, man. And uh, like I said, I just I didn't want any affiliation with that time in my career. Yeah, I was ready to start fresh with a whole new uh, energy, a whole new, you know, a whole new me. So that's why I did that. Yeah, no doubt. Now yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess that's that same reason why Shan says too. He's like, I wasn't going to no symphony session. He's like, I wasn't getting paid for these records. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And then uh, actually curious too. Uh, from this, after this, we'll move on completely from the Juice Crew. But just curious too, because uh, Shan was talking about how he's dropped out of the recent shows that you guys are doing. The, the most recent show. Yeah, the most re yeah, because I talked to him. I think literally the night that it was happening, or like the okay. night before or something. Yeah. But um, he said he was just got off the phone and was dealing. But was yeah, that was Juice Crew glamorous calling me. Oh, oh they asked me why I ain't doing a Juice Crew show. Oh shit! That's another story. You know what I'm saying? It's like I'm doing Juice Crew shows. We got a Juice Crew reunion tour, right? Yeah. How come is it Shan is the only one doing one song? Everybody else gets to do five and six or whatever. You know, they get to do what they do. But whoever's in charge of this Juice Crew shit now, mentioning no names, feels that my fans are, and, and are not as important as their fans that all my fans only deserve to hear the bridge that's all they know of yours say what not knowing yeah not 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 understanding that it was my songs that held the juice crew up before you niggas got down okay so don't act like oh, all of a sudden you came along and that you took it to a new no i held this spot while you was doing what you was doing you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So don't come tell me what my fans deserve to hear. And so that's why you won't hear me doing any more Juice Crew shows. And I'm not down with that Juice Crew thing anymore. Unless the promoter contacts me directly in order for me to do a show along with the Juice Crew, the person in charge cannot book me anymore. Cannot say how much I make. Cannot say how much time I have on stage. Cannot say anything. Was, is it, would that be the same sentiment then? Like, does Fly Tie those guys? They still own the name, or has it been bought Fly since Tide, then? And no, Fly Tie's not. I don't know who owns what. Yeah. Um. You know, one, Mr. Magic, I guess, created the name. I don't know. I don't believe that it was ever copywritten or anything like that or trademarked. Okay. And so Fly Tie just kind of uh, claims it. Like, like as if he inherited it from Mr. Magic when he passed away. He thinks he owns the name. But clearly, there's no ownership of that name. Yeah. And we're able to do tours with it. And we will continue to do tours with it. If Fatai would like to create a lawsuit, because he won't. Because he hasn't paid anybody. Because he doesn't anybody. have the evidence either. Because yeah. he hasn't paid anybody. So, for him to bring a lawsuit against artists that he hasn't paid... It's gonna it would be burn stupid. him, yeah. Yeah, so he'll just sit back and complain and talk junk in in his in his cheap cheap suits and and that'll be that. Yeah, it's a shame, man. It's a shame because the legacy is really like you know, like you said, like you know, Death Row and Cold Chill in that era of hip hop, like 
that's what you remember. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Unless you really were there at the time and you knew all these other underground cats who were putting stuff out. Like, dudes my age and stuff, you look back in history, like, that's the history you really know. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's a shame, man. But to move forward, um, see, so Ace One was your graffiti tag. Yeah. So you, you, were, you were burning for years then, I'm guessing. Eh? I don't want to say years. Like, I really... When I was in high school, that was when I kind of discovered Graph. Um, there was the, the documentary Star Wars came out. Yeah. I saw that and I just like was like, what? I don't know what this is, but I want to be a part of it. And so, but by then, by then there were like all these big time, you know, graph artists in my neighborhood doing their thing. So I was trying to get to know who those guys were. I got to meet a few of them, and um, it's a very underground community, though, right? So it's hard, it's hard to get yourself in there. Yeah. Super underground, and so. And, and you know I I was still at that age where and my grandmother my grandmother was my my, my main um, guardian at that time because my mom was down in Atlanta trying to yeah make things happen and so um, you know I couldn't be out one two in the morning bombing trains like I, I was I had to be home at a certain time so yeah I wasn't that like those guys were all older than me and they were out three four in the morning coming home, you know, pain on their hands and all that stuff. I couldn't do that stuff. So I was just kind of like right in my neighborhood. Yeah. In my building, in an elevator, in the hallway. And that was kind of my uh, introduction into graph. Um, and then I went to college. I went to college in 84. And then, uh, so for those four years in college, um, I wasn't going to be writing. I thought about it. Yeah. And I was like, I can't be in here like bombing and bomb up to school because it's gonna, it's not going. I'm gonna get caught. Like, yeah. Now we're getting kicked out of college yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I fell back from it, and then uh, after my uh, second album dropped in '93, uh, uh, Slaughterhouse, um, I met some 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 graph artists from the Bronx. Uh, shout out to my man Louis, Louis 167, and Rule, and this other kid Trap. Those guys are all from the BX, and I met them one day at a part at a hip hop party. And they were telling me, yeah, we write, we we bomb all the time, and I was like, word, man, I never really got to bomb. Like now I'm adult, now yeah. I'm an adult. I don't have to be home at a certain time. Can I go with y'all? And they were like, you serious? I'm like, yeah. So they was like, all right, and we exchanged numbers or whatever. And in '93, when my second album dropped, I'm taking the train, driving really up to the Bronx, parking and going, climbing fences, going through holes in fences. Walking through all kind of garbage and junk to ride on freight trains and walls and all this type of uh, stuff. Oh, so you did get to hit up trains yeah, and stuff before but it was they like, cleaned them all up. And yeah, shit. yeah, but ah. it was like it was like later um, in my in my in my life. I was I was I was an adult at that point. But um, so yeah, I did get to the chance to um, you know kind of realize those dreams of really going out and bombing on the streets and stuff. Yeah. Um, but it was way later, and it wasn't for years and years. It was just for a few. And then I then the Vandal Squads came, like uh, a couple years later. That, all coming with Giuliani and shit. Yeah, they yeah. created the Vandal. No, it was after it was before Giuliani. Was it okay? Yeah. But they created the Vandal Squads, and so the Vandal Squads, um, their job was to find out who certain writers were. Yeah. Who what their real names were? They would actually do investigations, and I was like, well, I got videos on TV. I probably shouldn't be... I'm going to be the easiest one to catch. Yeah, yeah. So I, at that point, I just kind of, like, fell back. Okay, and then, so... <clears throat> then when you went on uh, to use it as, like, one of your aliases as a producer... Yeah. We, like, was that almost just, like, kind of like a like a hint to the hip-hop heads? It's like, you, now you know who who was tagging that. It was just a way to kind of, like, rebrand myself in another way. Yeah. Um, Is there a reason why you didn't want people yeah. to know you were making the beats? Yeah, I mean, I, because I felt like... I, if I could create two separate um, two separate entities, you know, maybe, maybe my rap career doesn't pop off, but my producer career can pop off with this other name. Yeah. And so I looked at it as, a, you know, thinking from a marketing standpoint, it was a way to brand myself in two different ways and keep the two worlds kind of separate. This is, this is me rapper, this is me producer. You know, don't mix the two up. Yeah, because you're at also at that time in a process of rebranding yourself as an MC exactly. too, right? So exactly. it was almost kind of like a two birds with one stone type exactly. of thing. It's like yep. maybe either avenue. Okay, yeah, that that makes sense. Because I was kind of curious when you said that in one interview. I was like, because, yeah. you know, I know a lot of producers do that. But, you know, I'm always kind of curious. Well, actually, I do that myself as mm -hmm. well too. I produce under Maloney, artist named MLNY. So, sure. you know, I'm always kind of curious to see what ticks, uh, yeah. you know, what 
what caused other artists to do uh, that as well. But uh, with the Slaughterhouse album as well, I was kind of curious because that was kind of like your parody of like all the gangster rap going on time, right? Like yeah. kind of a mockery of it. And then when you did Sitting on Chrome, it was like what you said, your compromise album yeah. from the label because uh, Born to Roll worked. Yeah. But um, they're both kind of like, you know, the gangster rap was a heavy West Coast sound. And even though like, because Sitting on Chrome wasn't wasn't really sarcastic right like you're into car culture and shit right Absolutely. so it was kind of like an yeah. honest album still yeah but did you get flack from la at all from like the fact it's like oh yo like you're mocking gangster rap and now like where they might have thought you were mocking the car culture and stuff it's 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 so weird um i i missed the flack yeah from la because they didn't make the connection between the guy who did the Slaughterhouse song and was doing that that par that parody record, they didn't make the connection between that guy and this new record, Born to Roll, that's now being played on the radio, tw you know, thirty five times a day. Yeah. So I kind of, they were like, they didn't, they didn't work, they didn't care about that. Yeah. Like, the only people that really knew that it was the same person was the artists that were inside the industry, like Ice Cube and OC, you know, uh, those guys. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Mac Ten and those guys. Um, so. I just kind of, I I avoided it. I avoided that flack because the connection wasn't made. And maybe it's because those records weren't that big. Yeah. So because they weren't that big, they didn't get to the mainstream audiences so that they knew, oh, this is the same guy that, that was doing that record that's now doing this record. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that that's, that's the easy answer. But I did get a lot of flack from New York. From New York, yeah. Major flack. Because it, Slaughterhouse, even if they, if they didn't catch the parody, they're thinking first you're doing almost a gangster rap record, and then the Born to Roll. They're like, yeah. hey, why you why are you so West Coast? Yeah, they just thought I was uh, like trying to pander to that sound, and really I was just trying to combine the two worlds and make something new. And you're rebranding yourself at the time yeah, too, right? Yeah. So it's like almost separating yourself as far as you could from that Juice Crew image, yeah, doing something new. But um, one thing I'm curious of too is because you were probably one of the first New York rappers to ever kind of experiment with another sound another sound from a different uh coast right yeah i mean arguably because yeah because this is my thing right born to roll was the record that everybody pointed to and said oh that's some west coast stuff that sounds like west coast music yeah right? yeah but the record that i sampled was a def jam record yeah that was that that, that was that came out on def jam they played on the radio on the east coast all I did was rap over that same beat. Yeah. But it was just that the West Coast sound at that time was a throwback to production from the early New York days. The funk stuff, yeah. No, the the, the eight oh eight and nine oh. Oh okay, yeah, yeah. That stuff. <coughs> so the the, the the early New York yeah. sound. Yeah. And I just put the two things together and said, Okay, well they like it sounds like they like what we used to do, that, those drum sounds. that we Yeah. Because Marley Marl had a, a rolling 808 machine, and he used to use it all the time on all his records. They like bass. They like the boom. So all I'm doing is reaching back to the 80s. Yeah. And, 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 and rapping over music from that time period, and y'all are calling it West Coast music, but it really wasn't. It was, it was just a throwback to a time that I guess New York forgot about. Because yeah. That was our sound first. The eight oh eight and the nine oh nines was our stuff. Until before the sample heavy sample really came. Started. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's crazy too. And then and now you look at hip hop and a lot of artists complain about how there is no identity coast to coast. But like it, it wasn't until I was watching you once again the twenty inter, the twentieth anniversary of sitting on Chrome mm -hmm. and you said you're like, you know, I was kinda in a in a, in a sense with the way it was viewed, one of the first dudes who were like um kinda dabbling in like you know another coast kind of sound and it's like wow it's crazy because i never would have made that correlation and now you look at it and it's like the identity is so gone from almost everywhere yeah there's no 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 borders now no and how do you feel about that personally like do you wish there, that that certain area still had their own sound or do you yeah, like I it, do. everybody I, do nah, everything I, I miss the fact that new york has lost its identity yeah um you know we had an identity we we and we were in a lot of ways, we were kind of like the leaders of what was going on in hip in hip hop. We we led the way in terms of what stuff sounded like. Yeah. And I thought it was cool that the West Coast adopted their own sound, that the South kind of created their own sound, um, but that all of those sounds were able to coexist 
um, together on the radio and in clubs and stuff. You play some West Coast stuff, you play some South stuff, you play some East Coast stuff, and it all worked. Yeah. And I hate the fact that, um, you know, that New York artists now you can't tell that they're New York artists. Yeah. It, the music, the the way they're rapping, the cadences, they they have no connection to what New York is supposed to sound like because they were raised on New York radio, which in the last but fifteen twenty years has been a lot of down south stuff. Yeah. Um, New York New York radio has really um, kind of ushered in this new phenomenon which is cats from Brooklyn rapping over trap beats and and it's because that's all they hear so that's what they think it's supposed to sound like yeah and that's too bad yeah I agree well because I mean myself you know I I personally think the New York sound that's my favorite sound right and not to be biased or you know what I mean hey on anything else but that's you like exactly that's what connects with me though say you know basically like 86 to like 96 basically that decade is just like it's perfect like I, I I can't listen to a lot of new hip-hop you know I give everything a chance especially you know with doing media and stuff you have to you know you have to have an open ear of course but it, in my spare time if I'm gonna go check for some new shit I never heard you know I'm 20 I'm 29 right so okay. I didn't I was a little kid when all that 90s shit was happening. Right. So I go back, like, I just started listening to, like, Poor Righteous Teachers, like, mm. a few months ago. Like, holy shit, is that a tapped, go, untapped goldmine of just, like, incredible hip-hop. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's like, I'd rather go dig in the crates and find some stuff that existed prior that, like, it just makes me, like, it makes me break my neck opposed to, like, That's try right. to force myself to, like, some stuff that all sounds like everything else. Right. You know, and it's a shame, kind of, that, um, that that's happened in hip-hop, but in... I, and I think it's interesting too that like you, really you think like you would say it's the radio stations that really made it is. the it is because um, they used to support their own and then yeah I mean it, they at, at one point like I said New York led the way and then at some point New York started to follow New York radio started to follow other radio stations of other regions would listen to what New York was playing and they would play that and maybe mix in a few of their local artists yeah but then when the South when the, when the artists in the South started to really you know, break through without the help of the East Coast. Yeah. The, the, the East Coast DJs were like, oh, well, that's big out there, so maybe we need to play that. And then they started... It just became... I mean, they could have done that, but they just needed to still... It, they should have still supported the sound that was coming out of New York, you know, naturally. And, and they, they abandoned it completely. Yeah. All right. And um, so, yeah, man, so to move on a little bit forward from that, too. And, um, like, you got so much history in hip-hop, man. It's crazy. It's honestly, it's insane. And um, I think, like, I, my personal opinion, your top 10 greatest MCs of all time. Like, I think your catalog is just... I appreciate that. This, you know, you ask 100 people, you get 100 different answers. You do, yeah. Which I, you know, I, I respect for those that, that put me in their top list. That's great. I'm happy to to hear that. I, you know, if I made a top 10 list, I wouldn't put myself in there. Yeah. Um, but... I definitely, uh, I, I, I feel like the fans that, uh, that, that put me that in their, in their list like that are the real thinkers. Yeah. And, and, and the, and the fans that go beyond just the beat and the braggadocious raps and they like something that's a little deeper and more thought provoking. And so I think that's what I kind of speak to in those fans. They like music that's thought provoking, that's. That uh that evokes emotion, makes you feel a certain way, um, and that's what I'm good at. You do all that, and it's the like the reality. Like take a walk is like you know like one of the most perfect hip hop songs. You know what I mean? Like it's just like when you see the girl on the block before show for you rush over the 14 year old girls be dressed like she much older. That young chick walking the block trying to get paid is in the same class your sister is. Like it's like what? Like. Yeah. Just the reality and the way you make it vivid, and then yeah, like the you know enough like songs like that nostalgia. What like once again, that's what, that's probably. Well, I don't know if it's my favorite record of yours. It's my favorite record of Polos. Right. Um, but like that's like top twenty hip hop songs of all time to me. You. you know what I mean? I love that record. Like it's just the reality in it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and but the thing I like is when you go back in your career. You've covered all these other avenues of hip hop before you got to like the disposable arts ace. Right. You know what I mean? Like disposable arts and forward is my favorite material of yours, but I like how Mine too. you have that versatility. You know what I mean? Like you've proved it all throughout your career, continue to rebrand yourself, and that's what I think makes you a great. You know what I mean? It's like 
even disposable arts forward, you'd, you'd still be top ten. But I think it's just it's just incredible, man. You got so much history in this game, and I just you know I really appreciate what you do. Last time I talked to you, you said you were never gonna make another solo album again, and technically you haven't. Well. I think no, you did put one out in like sixteen, didn't you? Yeah, the the fallen season. Was, yeah, was me kind of going back on my word a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But for the most part, you've really actually held your word because even if you did like an album, you know, it's with Polo, so it's you know what I mean. Like, or some you know, Doom beat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. even if it's you as a solo artist, it's still a collaboration effort. So you know, um, because that, that's one thing. You know, I, I the game needs artists like you. You know what I mean? And, I, and every time I hear you know cats like you. Like, thinking about hanging it up, it's like, man, you can't, you can't. But you got to do what's right for you, too, right? So I do. Yeah. You know, there's, um, I have other, I have other aspirations, uh, for other other things I want to do with my writing. Yeah. Because I still want to write. I'm still a writer at heart, and uh, so I'm still going to write. Um, but I'd like to try some other things out, and so I'm working on that stuff now. I'm, I'm actually writing a, a, uh, a musical. Uh, for theater. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's loosely based on the the stories, the storylines on Disposable and A Long Hot Summer. Some of the same characters oh. from, from those albums are in the in the musical. Um, you'll hear some familiar names, um, and uh, and and it's loosely based on my you know my life, my upbringing, and and my circumstance. So I guess the falling season is also in there too. So it's a it's a fictional story, but it's based on those. Based stories. on reality, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's super cool. That's really dope. I think that would be really interesting because the way those albums are done too, right? Like, and the prelude being Hot Summer, and then, yep. yeah, I, I think that'd be really cool. And before I do move on as well, just talking about all the avenues you cover, the one I forgot to touch is your concept songs are crazy. Oh, thanks, man. You know what I mean? Like Hold You and stuff like that. Like, thanks. um, and on the new album, like um, the one where you're battling with MS. Oh yeah. Like fight song. Yeah, like. Man, just the, the concepts as well. It's just like, like you hit all those buttons, and then you do have punches. Like you do have br br records where you're braggadocious and yeah. and and you spit bars. You know what I mean? Like you touch all the, you ch you check all the boxes. Of what makes a great and overall well-rounded MC to me? You know I what I mean? Because for five years you, uh, you know, you were releasing singles and stuff, but you were kind of. You didn't really have a single home, right? Like you re you release records under like singles under all these different labels. Yeah, I was I was kind of done is that is that why yeah. you just kind of you would make I was, a i was kind of done like the because I, I i did an album with uh with, with uh atlantic records big beat big beat atlantic and uh in 98 i believe it was they decided to shelve it like they just decided not to put it out oh so, shit so that just like kind of just killed my whole vibe for the for the industry for the music i was like i'm done with this and i really left it alone for like from like about early 98 all the way to 2000 I was like I ain't, I'm not messing with it and then slowly some, the feeling started to kind of come back so those records that you're talking about was me trying to see if I still felt it okay so I started throwing little singles little out, Lucy's I, I, out and yeah stuff. I did something with Jay Love I did another single was, with uh, the Jay Love was that the one uh, Hellbound New York Conf Confidential okay NY Confidential the Hellbound joint was uh, on um the uh, game over compilation. Cause that was that was with Eminem. Who was the other guy? I thought Jay Black. Jay Black. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I was trying to think of his name on yeah. the way here. And I'm like, fuck, I can't remember his name. Yep. So, uh, but yeah, all those little records that I popped up on between like '99 to 2000 through 2000 were me trying to put my toe in the water and see if I really still felt like I wanted to do it or not. Yeah. And then, obviously, in 01, I decided to do it, and that was disposable. Okay, so that's why they're all different labels, because, you know, you yeah. put one out, you're, like, not really with it. I did and the then... Brooklyn Blocks thing with Duck Down, too. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I was curious yeah, yeah, yeah. about, too, because, like, Duck Down's a pretty, you know, stable home. So I was, and, I, I, and thinking about it, I'm like, you and Duck Down could have done some really cool work together, so. Yeah, I just, they, they already had an identity. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't feel like I had necessarily blended in well with it. Yeah. And I am friends with those guys, and I didn't want to, uh, you know, you start doing business with friends, shit could get Ruined relationships, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then before uh, going forward from there, too, uh, I was curious, so that was the Hellbound, was that the Jay Black's record, or was that your record? That was n neither. That was, oh, okay. That was a, a, that was a, a Game Over compilation song um, 
that they put because they they put this compilation together with a with a mismatch of different verses from different people. Yeah, different people coming to the studio, and so they had this Eminem verse that he recorded like back like ninety seven or something. And they just had this verse. He came in, they paid him. He, he This was before he was known. He was hot, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had the verse, they paid him for it, and they just never did anything with it. And so then they, came, they had this idea to do this compilation album, and they uh, put his his vocals over this video game. I think it was Excalibur, one of these old video games. Yeah. And made a beat off of it and put him put it to that, and then they were like, okay, let's find two more rappers to. Fill, oh, fill it out. okay, so that's how that all went yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because Eminem credits you as one of his fi- biggest inspirations yeah, too, right? So that's why I was I was curious if you guys actually were in the lab to do that record, nah, or I it just kind of happened like that. It just happened like that. They were sitting on the verse, and he was probably happier than the pig and shit when he's like, "Oh, Ace is on the record." <laughs> well, by, honestly, by the time, by the time he heard the, re- I played him, I played the record for him. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. I, I played the record for him in 2001, right, 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 right before Disposable came out, because I was trying to get him on a song for Disposable. Oof. Yeah, he was supposed to be on. Well, I wanted him to be on the song that. The one um, with Young Z. Yep. Ah man, that would have yep. been this fucking crazy joint. But but by then, M was famous. By then, he was already. You know, he was on the Up and Smoke tour. He was on the Up and Smoke tour with Dr. Dre and Ice Cube and others. So this is like right when he was taken. Yeah, he was like, about to be out of here. Yeah. And um, I went to the concert. His his uh, his, his road manager, um, Mark, was able to get me backstage. Yeah. My first time ever meeting him. Okay. And I had the uh, CD or something, I, I but I played him. Hellbound, and he's listening to it, and he's like, "Oh, I, rem- I remember this rhyme. I remember this rhyme." Like, but he had he done it like what four years before. So yeah. As he was listening to it, he's like, "Yeah, I remember this rhyme. I remember this rhyme." Um, and that it was at that same meeting that I that I gave him a copy of the Something's Wrong beat with my verse. I I don't know if Strick was on there yet or not. But I just I, I gave him a copy of the song and I was like, this is a song I would like you know you you to get on if you can. And he took it. We waited a few weeks and you know the manager um, got in got in the middle and was just like, Paul probably yeah yeah. Paul. And he's and, you know he's just like yo my man just saying it's not a good time to 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 do it so sorry we can't do it. And, uh-huh. and, and, that, and that was the end of that. It's unfortunate too, man, because not only would that have been a great record, but you know. Um... You know, like with with researching Eminem, there, there's a few points in his career where there's opportunities handed him, like stuff like that. Where though he might have been out of here, you could tell as the hip hop fan he, he was, wanted he it. wanted to do it. He wanted and to do And Paul's it. persuaded him kind of not yeah. to do it. Like yeah. that's kind of how him and Cannabis's thing kind of started too and stuff. Yeah. And just like you know, as someone you know who loves the art form that much, it's a shame to see that because like a I, record. I, as I think back on it, like I don't. I don't know what Paul. I never asked Paul what his reasoning was for not letting him do it, but I, I don't see that it would have hurt his career in any way. No, not at all. If anything, it would have got the under. You know, I think he might have been afraid because if if M gets on a record like that, it opens up the floodgates. Yeah, and then his so asking price people, comes down. But, but not even that. But fifty different people are now going to be asking him to. You did a song with Mass Ace. You could do a song with me. Yeah. You know, and I can only imagine what the pressure of that could turn into. So yeah. That that, that could have had something to do with it. The only other record that he was on at that time was the Jay-Z record. Yeah, Renegade. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was the only record that he did. Yeah, it's really the only feature, yeah, in yep. those first few years that he did do, aside from, like, Aftermath stuff. So it was kind of like Paul saying, you know, we got to pick and choose those 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 features very carefully and make sure you're, that you're aligned with big, big names that are either bigger than you or on the same level as you, and, that, and, and so that's why. Yeah. But for the love of hip hop, I wish he had done it. Yeah, same man. That would have been a crazy record. And you had Z on there too. The yeah. outside is like Z was Z was. I asked Z after M was named. Okay, because he well, kind of fit that and pocket. This is outsiders, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes sense. That's dope, man. That's really dope. And um, well, if Eminem, hopefully you hear this someday, because I know Eminem's in a different spot now. He can do whatever the fuck he wants. I'd love to hear an Ace and M record. Anything's possible. That would be big, man. That would be really big, just for hip hop. You know what I mean? But um, one thing I do want to ask about too, because my favorite producer of all time. I didn't realize how far you guys went back till I seen a clip uh, just a few days ago. But it was DJ Premier talking about how you guys, the first time you met, was out in LA. 
we met before that. Oh, had you? Okay. Yeah, we, we, that was probably your first time in, in LA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So what? how did you and Preem originally meet up then? I met Preem, I met Guru first. Oh, yeah, okay. So me and Guru, fellow MCs, whatever, Brooklyn, and so we would hang out. And then he was, it was at the time that he was working on the No More Mr. Nice Guy album with Preem. And so he had me come to the studio. I met Preem at the studio. Actually, the studio that they were working out of was, was called Firehouse. Yeah. And they introduced me to the engineer Firehouse, and that's where I worked on Slaughterhouse at. Oh, shit. So, eh? so, so that's how that whole thing came about. Like, like literally, um, I was like, yeah, I got to work on this album. I don't have a studio. Come check out this spot that we work out of. Yeah. They brought me over there, introduced me to the... The, the the studio owner and I and I decided to do my album there. Oh shit, eh? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. And so when you met Guru, then had he already started working with Prima, or was this back when he was still work, working with the other producer? No, he was he was already working with Premier like early though. Like, yeah. They were just starting to. They were still getting to know each other too. You yeah. Know what I'm saying like, um, but yeah, they were they were still getting to know each other. Um, and I was around in the very beginnings of gang star. Oh and man. We would go to parties together and meet each other up at parties and talk to girls and all that kind of stuff. Like this is before anybody had a plaque or any kind of real notoriety. It was just fellas that loved the music and loved the culture just all hanging out together and just enjoying enjoying life. Yeah. Yeah. And was that before would that have been before your first album as well too then? Mm, or in the pro no. That your album would have been out by then. Yeah, my first album was already out. Cause that was eighty eight, right? Or was that 89? first album was ninety. Ninety? Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I'm oh, not... cause Mr. Nice Guy, yeah, was yeah, yeah 90, okay, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Nice Guy might have been ninety one or ninety two. Yeah, I think ninety one. Somewhere in there. Daily Operation ninety two. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, that's crazy, man. And then uh, for Guru, like, I know Guru. Um, at a certain period, had had a little bit of a wild side to him. Do you got any like a little bit of a cra- wild side? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I mean, he, you know. He would he would he, when he got drunk he would just get a little a little out of hand at times and yeah. I, I I I remember you know at D and D kind of having to talk him down off the ledge a little bit because he got a little a little hyped up over the over the liquor and he when he he's one of those one of those uh, people that when they drink too much they want to fight everybody yeah and you know Premier was very 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 cool and calm though and and so I think that because of Premier's demeanor versus Guru's. I started hanging out with Premier more than Guru because yeah. I wasn't I wasn't that wild, crazy, out of control drinker dude. Um, I like to know you could just go chill and chill, not have yeah, to potentially yeah, yeah, yeah. get somebody out of a situation or exactly, something. Exactly. Yeah, but I I do remember you know having to talk Guru down from uh, being mad at Premier about something at the in the studio and wanting to you know want to fight him. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> Let's go outside, cool off. Like, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, man, those guys, man, like like I said, we were, I was, neck, we were right there together, like just living life, man. Um, I had a, I had a cookout when I was living in Queens. I want to say this was like ninety two or maybe almost ninety three, and they uh, they came out to my crib with, with with a bunch of their crew, and I had some other friends from my neighborhood, and we uh, we actually went to the park, and played. I don't know if you're familiar with the game Ultimate. No. It's like basically like football, but with a frisbee. Okay. So you uh you have teams or whatever, and you, you know, you can't run with the frisbee. You can only throw it. Yeah. So everybody else can move, and try to get open, and yeah. you just kind of fling the frisbee. You, you catch it, you stop, and the guy can try to guard you and throw it to the next guy. So, yeah, they were they were out there. It's almost kind of like basketball meets football with a yeah. frisbee in a sense. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And um and you try to make it to the end zone. Oh shit! Okay. So yeah, we had uh, we were out there playing ultimate man. Me and Gangstar Foundation and a bunch of other people just having a good time. That's wild, man. That's so cool, man. Like I just you know that that's another thing I think hip hop's missing nowadays is that you know camaraderie. It is, man. Like Cause, a lot of because the money got the money got involved. Like we were nobody we had a lot of money back then. Yeah, so you guys are all just in it for the culture, the love, the just yeah, just trying to trying to make it happen and trying to be a little famous if you could. You know, yeah. a little hood famous is always nice. Be recognized on the street. Whatever. A little bit of clout, you know, yeah. make it easier to pick up some chicks and right. might get some free weed if you smoke weed or <laughs> right. whatever it is. And um, and then so eat was that the first joint you and Prem ever actually did? That was your joint then. First joint. I thought so. Yeah. First first Primo beat that I rapped over 
first record of mine that I made with DJ Premier. That's crazy. Uh, he did the scratches on side on my song Saturday Night Live. Oh, did he? Okay. And a lot of people thought he did the beat because at the beginning you hear the voice DJ Premier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that was just him doing the scratches. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because when I was when I was coming up, I mean, back before I ever cop disposable arts, when I just like you know this is like LimeWire days and stuff, when you just like you got like you know the tracks wow, you could Lime find Wire and stuff. Shit. You remember that shit? This might even be Napster. But I always thought, um, I always thought, no regrets was a primo beat back in those days, and I always thought um, Enough was a primo beat. Oh, yeah, no. Nah. But no, nah, as I got older, I read credits, and, you know, really got to know his sound, because, you know, mm -hmm. he's my favorite producer now, but at that time, I was kind of really just digging, you know, learning, like, all his history. I'm like, man, this guy, like, I knew him from Gangstar, and I'm like, you did... Yeah, Ill, you did these Illmatic joints, you did the Jays, you did, you did like you did like all my favorite rappers' favorite songs. That's you know right. what I mean? It's like yeah. it's crazy, but I, I those uh, those beats at, at the time I always thought were premier joints. So then when I learned they weren't, I'm a little disappointed, right? And as I got older, I'm like, man, I wish Ace and Premier would work. So finally did it. Yeah, when I seen that, I'm like, yo, and that track's crazy, by the way. I sat on that beat for since 2011. Holy shit, eh? Yeah, I heard that beat in, in 2011. We uh, we were on tour in Australia together. It was me. Marco Polo, I was with Ed OG, me and Ed OG had a tour with, with Beat Nuts and DJ Premier. Was that when you guys put out A&E? Yes. Okay. And so we were doing an A&E tour, but we were with Beat Nuts and Premier in Australia. And we were in Sydney, and at the Sydney Soundcheck, Premier put that beat on. And as soon as, that, as, soon as it came on, I said, yo, what's that? <laughs> and he was like, yo, this is for, um, because at the time he was working with an artist named Nick Javis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's like, this is Nick Javis joint. And I was like, yo, I need that right there. He's like, yo, it's his beat. You got to talk to him. So I went after uh, after sound check and I pulled him to the side and I, I talked to Nick and I was like, yo, what's up with that? And, and he's like, yo, I, I can't come up off that beat. That's for my grandma. It's a song I wrote about my grandmother and this and that. And I was like, damn, word. All right. And I was so disappointed, but I was like, what? A, what? A, I just kind of, le I left it alone, but it was still in the back of my head. Yeah. And then... Maybe a year and a half or so later, I found out that they weren't working together anymore. Oh, so it's kind of like the guy who finds that the, he liked this girl, but she was married. And, <laughs> and then, then he finds find out that they single. broke up, and he calls her like, "Yo, hey, how you been doing?" So I called up, so I, so I called up Premier, and I was like, "Yo, what's up with that Nick Javis beat that I heard in Sydney?" He, like, he only he didn't even remember the beat. Yeah, I was like, "Yo, I'll." I'll he's like, "I got a whole um, bunch of Nick Javis beats that aren't being used." A bunch of them I already gave the Bumpy Knuckles. Oh, so that's how those albums probably started. And he's like, I don't know, I don't know if if that's one of the ones or not, but I'll play you the ones that Bumpy Knuckles didn't pick. Yeah. And we sat in his car, and I was like, that one, that's it right there. He's like, it's yours. I was like, bet. And I said, and I, and I had that beat since that time. So it was 2011 was when I first heard it, and <laughs> I, I got possession of it in 2000, probably 12, around there, 13. And I've been sitting on it ever since. Holy shit, eh? Yeah. yeah. And then um, with, to get evidence on it, like, did you and evidence have a relationship prior to that? We, or did, did you didn't. just hear him on it? You know what happened? Um, I went to his show. He had a show in Brooklyn at the Knitting Factory. Me and Marco went together. Yeah. And we still hadn't really had... We, we hadn't really had that many features for the album yet. We were still trying to figure out who would, who would be, be on what. And you guys already knew the primo joint was going on there? Or? Um... No, well, I had to beat. Yeah. But it wasn't... It wasn't, wasn't spoken for that yet. Yeah, nothing had even been decided yet, but I met Evidence after the show, or it might have been before the show, before he went on stage, and um, he was like, yo, good to finally meet you. And I didn't even realize that we never met before. I thought, I thought, I thought, I, I thought, sure, we had met, you know, previously or whatever. And um, we talked briefly, and I was like, yo, it would be dope to have you on a record. He's like, yo, let me know. And that's pretty much how the ball got rolling, and it was just me figuring out which record. And and once we had every every when once every other song was kind of like figured out, I was like, I think the Primo joint is the right one for Evan. I think that'd be ill. Yeah. And that was it. Good selection too, because yeah, Evidence and Primo yeah. always sound yeah. good together. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. shout out to Ev, he's a friend of the show. We Absolutely. interviewed him last year. Yep. Shout out to Evidence. Yeah, that's that's dope, man. I, when I, as soon as I seen, because when you guys put the album out, I can't remember if it was you or Polo. But um, one of you guys posts and you're like, yeah, in the bonus joint, and it's like DJ Premier produced, featuring evidence. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, that that was, sounds crazy. So that that was the I, first joint I went and peeped. 
that's a good one to hold on to. Yeah, man. Cool. That's a cool story behind that too, man. That's a good history. I'm glad I asked you about that. And um, like I said, man, I don't want to keep all your time. I know you here at the studio. You got other things going on as I'm, well. I'm heading back home after this. All right, all right. Um, you know, yeah, there's so much history to talk about, man. So we'll 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 cut it because the show shows an hour. So we'll we'll uh, we'll 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 get to the end of it here. And, you know, maybe uh, we'll get a chance to chop it up again sometime sure. and, you know, go through some of the other stuff I got down. But um, so one thing I'm just wondering now is uh, with the new album out, by the way, I love it. Brooklyn's phenomenal. It's my favorite project that's come out. Did they, co did they come out the end of last year or early this year? November 9th last year. Yeah, so it was the end of last year. Mm -hmm. I, I still, I count the last two months as the... I'll take this, it. I'll um, take it. But it's, it's my favorite album so far this year. Like, it's... That's that sound I love, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I like how uh, Polo took a different approach for you, you know, with the, the way he did the samples and stuff this time, and you know, and um, just everything, I just think it came out flawless. I love the tracks, I love the concepts. You're still as sharp as ever on it. Love the album. I'm just curious, do you got anything else? You know, you talked about the uh, musical and stuff. Do you got anything else musically in the works right now that fans can kind of salivate and wait on? Uh, no. Um really there's so much more going into this record like because marco's doing remixes and our, our goal is to really to tour with this record for the next two years which i really feel like we'll be able to do yeah it deserves that push yeah I, I i feel so and so i don't want to take like if i drop another record like in two months it'll 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 pull momentum and steam away from what we're trying to do with this record so i yeah. don't want to do that um so i'm taking all my creative energy and i'm putting it into this musical because I have to write all these songs um, there's a lot of songs for and different songs for different characters I think I'm going to probably bring in a couple of other writers to write some of the songs for some of the characters Yeah. but generally speaking um, I got to write an entire musical which you know act one is probably seven songs and then act two might be seven eight songs so it's basically like writing an album Yeah. so that's where all of my creative you know, writing energy is going to be going to is this this uh, this this musical. Okay, dope. Yeah. yeah, man, I look forward to that. That'll be awesome. It's gonna be cool, man. It's, gonna, it's coming out. It's coming out really good. I'm I'm I'm. It's so crazy because when you're writing a story like this, um, and it's and it's you know a fictional story, but kind of based on real life. So th there are if there are fictional aspects of the storyline that you have to create, and so coming up with the ending and what's going to happen with the characters I'm at that point now because I'm already in act two I'm like last three scenes of act two and I got all of this all these loose ends that I got to tie, tie up, up in, yeah. in, in, in three acts and I'm trying to figure out how to do it and that's the but that's the fun part that's like when I'm when I'm making one of my records when I'm making one of my albums and, and I'm you know writing the skits and trying to figure out how the skits and the songs are going to all kind of sequence and blend together and how why this song should come before this skit and this song this skit song comes after this skit so i'm at that point of of of, of sequencing and figuring out the all of these storylines for all these characters and um it's going great but i'm definitely at a at a big pivotal moment in the writing and i'm like just sitting there like what do i do how do i do this how do i fix this and 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 it, it, but it can't be fixed in a because i see so many you know, movies and TV shows and stuff like that where you can tell that the writer got stuck. A cheap ending. And gave up. Yeah, like, yeah. Fuck it. I'm just going to... Kill this guy and kill this yeah, guy. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, you, you, watch, you watch this whole thing and then it's, oh, the ending is whack and you're like, yo, you you, you gave up. So that's 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 my, my goal is to tie this thing together neatly, nicely, in a way that the people that watch it and see it are going to feel good and happy with the way it went and so that's yeah. why that's where i'm at that's, that's the tricky part but that's the challenge and that's the great part about writing and actually with you saying that reminded me of one other thing i would not there's no question about it but i and i don't know what your story is so i don't know if, if this could be a horrible suggestion but one <laughs> thing that could be a cool way to tie it in you know that joint 2040 you did with kid tsunami oh that shit is so dope man you know, I don't know. I see. I don't know where the story goes exactly, but I mean, just on the base, you know, because that's kind of like you seeing yourself in the future. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that works or anything. That's a cool suggestion. I'm not. I don't. I don't know that if it would work, but right, it's not. It it, it, it it could work. But, yeah. You know, my my vision for the way that it was going to end. 
that takes it doesn't go that far into the future. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So that's the only thing. But but I I like that idea though. That song's a, that song incredible too. I did want to bring that up to you because I Thank feel you. like that's a joint that got slept on a lot. And that song. That's cool. That's a cool joint. I really like that joint a lot. Man. It was fun to write that. And um, but yeah, man. And one last question I ask every artist that I get on the show. Um, if your lyrical style, you're familiar with Mortal Kombat, right? You used to play it, I'm sure, at some I point. Was at a, I was at a video arcade yesterday that had Mortal Kombat, and the whole the whole entire arcade was old school, old school video Oh, word, eh? You name it. Frogger, Dig Dug. Ah, man. Asteroids, Space Invaders, you, Phoenix. That's not in the city, is it? It's in Jersey. Ah, okay. It's, it's, a, worth, it's a worthwhile trip, man. Oh, I'm man. Actually, you know what? I, when we're done, I'll look and see if there's one in the city. There might be. There's one in Staten Island. There might be one in the city. Word. But, yo. Anyway, go That's ahead. Mortal dope. Kombat, go. Um, if your lyrical style could be transformed into a Mortal Kombat finish and move, a fatality, oh, what would it do to your opponent? Oh, man. That's a crazy question. Um, I feel like my style, it's not, it's not like... Like, Wu-Tang is, like, razor sharp, cut your head off, pull your spine out, and all of that, like, you know, blood and guts everywhere. Yeah. I feel like my style is more internal. Yeah. So, you would bleed from the eyes, <laughs> bleed from the nose, and just, like, and then, you're, like, your 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 skeleton and your insides would just liquefy, and you would just fall into a pile <laughs> of just, like a rug, just drop. <laughs> Melted flesh. Yes. <laughs> Vaporize them. Yep. All right, my well, man. Well, thank you very much for your thank time, you, Ace. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. And uh, much success with the tour and everything on the new album, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yo, what's up? It's your man, MLNY Maloney, Breaking Records, Breaking Records Radio. You know what it is. I'm just here to tell you guys right now that you want to, if any of my smokers out there, basically, any of my Canadian smokers, now that it's legal, what you got to do is you got to head over to thccollection.com and check them out. And make sure you use the promo code HIPHOP. That's H-I-P-H-O-P. And that's all capital letters. Save 10% on every purchase that you make anytime. They got everything. They got deals every single day of the week, which include like free whatever with whatever you buy. And uh, my favorite is Tulip Tuesday. You can get $100 ounces. And that's only on Tuesdays. And you save 10% on every purchase with the promo code HIPHOP, all caps. That's H-I-P-H-O-P. So make sure you go over there. Check them out. That's THCCollection.com for all your good medical needs, for all your good gr greenery, your extracts, and all that good stuff.